Well, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and also slightly trembling given how much I know uh, this is such a poignant uh, question to be addressing. Um, what I would love to do in order to address this question is to begin by reading out a fairly lengthy passage from the Bible, which is one of the most uh, dramatic uh, passages in the Bible full of pathos, uh, because of the relationships that are involved. And then I want to talk about this question following on from that passage for about 20 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have some time of question and answer where I promise not necessarily to be able to answer every one of your questions to your satisfaction, but I do promise to um, do my best to try to uh, respond to the difficult uh, questions um, that we will be engaging with tonight. Now, the passage that I want to start with, it comes from the book of uh, John in the Bible from chapter 11. And let me just read it out to you. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. Now picking up from a few verses later. On his arrival to Judea, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This evening we are considering one of the most difficult questions facing Christian faith today. 
the question of pain and suffering, disease and death. In my experience of talking about the Christian faith in all sorts of settings, schools, universities, workplaces, government institutions, the most common objection that people have today as to why they cannot believe in the existence of a good and loving God is the presence of pain and suffering in our world. I'm sure you've heard the objection. It goes something like this. If your God is so loving as you say, then why does he allow so much suffering and so much pain to happen? So much sickness and so much death. If he really cared about us, wouldn't he intervene? Wouldn't he do something? But although this may be a difficult question to face, it's not a question that takes the Bible by surprise. In fact, as we read in our passage just a moment ago, it's a question that we find within the very pages of the Bible itself. Remember when Mary and Martha, who are good friends of Jesus, send message to him to come quickly because their brother Lazarus, who's also a friend of Jesus, is sick. Jesus gets the message, but he doesn't leave Straight away, he, he delays. Meanwhile, the sisters sitting by Lazarus' side have to experience the grief and the horror of seeing this sickness slowly overcome their brother. And eventually, he dies. And when Jesus does eventually make it to Bethany, Lazarus has been dead a number of days. And when Mary sees Jesus, she falls at his feet and says those words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So you see the natural response of Mary and of Martha and other friends and family was to ask the Lord Jesus that question, where were you? Why didn't you show up and do something? You're a miracle worker. You're a healer. You've got the power to stop this sort of thing. So why didn't you? And the unspoken question, don't you even care? I remember the first time I asked God a question like that. I wonder if you have ever asked God a question like that. Do you even care? For me, it was when as a young man I sat beside the bed of my grandmother. She'd been in a terrible uh, accident and, and the, uh, the bones in her leg had, had all shattered and it caused one of the main arteries in her leg to, to be pierced. And what it meant was that she would slowly bleed to death and that there was nothing the doctors could do to operate. And so as I sat by her bed as she was racked in pain, struggling to breathe, dying what seemed to me a needlessly slow and painful death over a number of days. And as each labored breath got worse and worse as her lungs filled with fluid, I knew that God had the power to stop this, and he didn't. Why not? Why did he allow so much pain? We shouldn't be surprised if, like Mary and Martha, we find ourselves asking these sort of questions in response to suffering. And what is Jesus' response to Mary? Does he get mad at her? Is he completely disinterested in her petty human questions? No, we read in verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, that Jesus wept. The God of the Bible is not immune to our suffering. He's clearly moved by it. He cares. In fact, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is in the book of Psalms, and that paints a picture of God as the one who holds all our tears in a bottle. Every single one of your tears matters to God. Nevertheless, suffering can still test our belief in God's goodness because as human beings, we're tempted to think that if we were God, well, we would just get rid of sickness and suffering and death altogether. So why doesn't God? That was the reaction of some of the onlookers in response to Jesus' late arrival to the scene. They said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And this is the challenge that faith in Jesus faces for many onlookers today, including influential atheists who hold up a, a, a list of the tragedies and misfortunes which happen in our world today from refugee crises to school shootings 
to suicide bombings, to tsunamis, to bone cancer, to, to COVID, and, and, and ask, where is this, this supposedly all-loving, all-powerful God of yours? So how does Christianity respond to this question, which is a question that any belief about what life is all about has to grapple with? Well, as was well said, um, there are no easy or simplistic answers here because suffering is a deep and a profound issue, both as a question and as an experience. It's something that we will all experience sooner or later, profound suffering, profound loss. And so it's a question we ought to take very seriously, particularly in conversation with hurting people. I just want to say off the bat, it's really important to know that when people are in the very midst of grief and of tragedy, that's rarely the time for giving answers. That's more a time for just coming alongside and just being with people and letting them know that you care. And yet there is also at some point, a time for answers because heartfelt questions deserve thoughtful answers. And although there are no easy answers, as I said, Christian faith does have helpful and meaningful things to say in response to the question of suffering. And so this evening, I would love to share with you uh, five insights from the Bible, which taken together offer us, I believe, good reason to continue to hope and trust in a God who loves us even in the midst of profound suffering and pain. The first one is this, that the Bible affirms our instinct that the way this world is, is not the way that it should be. Have you ever paused to wonder why it is that we feel as though the way the world is, with all its pain and suffering, is not right? Or have you ever wondered why sickness and death feel like such intruders? Doesn't death feel like an intruder, a thief, an enemy? Why is that? Because if atheism is right and there is no God, then the physical universe is all there is. And the way things are is just the way things are. In that sense, sickness, suffering, pain and death should feel as natural to us as sunshine and flowers. They should feel just as natural to us as any other part of the natural order. But of course they don't. In other words, atheism... As a, as a view of life, cannot make sense of our instinct that something is wrong with the world. But Christianity can. The Bible confirms the cry of our hearts that the way this world is, is not the way that it should be. And it tells us why. It explains that the moral freedom that God gave us to choose love, we have used to reject that love and God's wisdom and that our relationships have fractured as a result. Our relationships with uh, others, our relationships with ourselves, our relationship with the, with the, the uh, nature around us, all stemming from a fractured relationship with God. And... Um, This is what theologians sometimes call the fall, the beginning of sin. A doctrine points out the uh, journalist G.K. Chesterton that's been empirically validated by over 2,000 years of human history. The world is not the way that it should be, and we are not the way that we should be. The second insight from the Bible is that the Bible explains why suffering does not disprove the existence of a loving God. The the argument that suffering disproves the existence of a good God is not considered by most philosophers today to be a sound argument because of something called the free will defense. Some of you may have heard this. It's It's a defense which holds that the best of all possible worlds is a world that allows for love and therefore for free will, because you cannot have love without free will. To give you an illustration, if my wife had held a gun to my head and said to me uh, before we were married, um, would you like to marry me? 
And if I had said yes, that wouldn't have been out of a response of love. It would have been a response of fear. Now, just in case you're worrying, uh, she didn't uh, propose to me like that. Um, uh, such things have been outlawed as of the last eight years in Australia, so um, that didn't happen. But in order for God to create a world that allows for love, it must be a world full of creatures who have the ability to love, and therefore it must be a world full of creatures who have morally significant free will, because love that is not freely given is not truly love. But for, for creatures to possess genuine moral freedom means that those creatures must also be granted the freedom to choose to reject God and his love, to choose to live uh, without reference to God and without reference to his wisdom. Now, God could create a world without any evil and suffering by instead of creating morally free creatures, God could have created automatons, creatures without free will, who always do the right thing like pre-programmed robots. Now, if you're a parent, you might think, well, I wish I had been able to create my children like pre-programmed robots, come, who you only have to ask them once to come inside or to do their homework. But God said, no, I want a genuine relationship of love. And, 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 and so instead of creating automatons, God created us. Philosophers say the best of all possible worlds is arguably a world that in allowing for the possibility of love must also allow for the reality of freedom and therefore the possibility of pain. And of course, the biblical story of creation echoes this philosophical line of reasoning holding that when God chose to create, as I said, he didn't create robots, he created us. Creatures with the freedom to choose. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it also teaches that the life and freedom God gave us to choose love, we have used on the whole to reject God's love. And as a result, we and to some extent, the creation around us are broken. And you only have to pick up a newspaper any day of the week, any month of the year, any year to realize we are seriously broken. There is something wrong. The third thing, the Bible reminds us that not all suffering is meaningless. A friend of mine grew up in Nepal. His parents were medical missionaries who treated people with leprosy. And he explained to me many years ago that leprosy is caused by a bacteria that destroys nerve endings so that people lose the ability to feel pain. And it's not actually, as I had thought, the leprosy that causes the deformity in hands and feet. It's the persistent injuries that occur as a result of the person being unable to experience pain. They stub their toe and they don't realize it. They put their hand in the fire and they don't feel it. Now, in the modern West, in the UK, we're accustomed to thinking of pain and suffering as our greatest enemies with no meaning whatsoever, no upside. And that's because we are accustomed to thinking of happiness through a very reduced, simplistic lens of pain minimization and pleasure maximization. And so we imagine that if God exists, he should create a world without any pain or any suffering. And it's many commentators have said that when a secular culture sees the meaning of life as being free to be able to do whatever you want whenever you want to, it's totally unsurprising that it sees all suffering as meaningless and cruel and therefore totally unsurprising that the modern West is the least equipped culture in human history to be able to deal with suffering and with pain. But as any psychologist will attest, Suffering will often aid us in our growth as human beings. Suffering will often help us to develop patience and wisdom as well as compassion and understanding towards others, which is why most other cultures throughout human history have seen that suffering is not completely meaningless. It was the writer John Eldridge who once said, I don't trust a man who hasn't suffered. And I think that's something that we can all sense has truth to it. Something else suffering does very interestingly is 
often cause people to seriously consider God's existence for the first time in their life. The atheist philosopher Luke Ferry observes that it's our experiences of heartbreak and tragedy and suffering more than anything else in this life that incline us to consider whether in fact there must be more to life than just this life, whether in fact there is a God. The Christian writer C.S. Lewis echoes this idea when he writes, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So as you can see, the existence of pain and suffering in the world, it's not all completely meaningless. It's not all bad. And obviously, nor is it all good. The reality is far more nuanced. Suffering, in a way, forces us to ask ourselves, what is life really all about? And as much as it causes many to question the existence of a loving God, and that is a genuine question to have, it's just as true that it causes many who've never given God a second thought to think again and to maybe even pray for the first time in their lives. Fourthly, the Bible reveals that God himself suffers with us. That writer I mentioned earlier, C.S. Lewis, tragically lost his mother when he was just a boy. And he describes himself as a young man before he became a Christian. He didn't become a Christian until later in life when he was a professor at Oxford University. So he's describing himself back as he's a young man. Remember, he tragically lost his mother when he was just a boy. And he says, I lived in a world of contradictions. He writes, I maintain that God did not exist. I was also very angry with God for not existing. And I was equally angry with God for creating such a world as this. And as Lewis's writing points out, that the simple truth is that suffering gets no easier when we get rid of God. In the midst of suffering, we don't need a better philosophy. We need a friend who loves us and who can truly understand what we're going through. And the God of the Bible does understand. For as the Russian novelist Dostoevsky observed while staring at a painting of Jesus' body, no other God has scars. No other God has scars. The cross is God's answer to a hurting world. On the cross, we encounter a God who is willing to identify with us to such an extent that he has bodily entered into our world of suffering, experiencing what it is to be not only hungry, tired, cold, but also rejected, humiliated, spat on, mocked, tortured, and ultimately executed. Of all the major responses to suffering, this is utterly unique. And we see this most clearly when we consider the Bible's response to the question of suffering against the alternative responses available. Because often the contrast is the mother of clarity. So what are the major responses to suffering? Well, very hard to do in just a couple of minutes, but let's get, go through some of them. Firstly, consider the karmic response to suffering. In summary, you do bad things, bad things happen to you. You do good things, good things happen to you. The idea of the Hindu caste system comes out of this karmic idea. If you are born into the highest class, the Brahmin caste, it's because you did good things in your previous life. If you're born into the lowest caste, the untouchables, it's because you did bad things in your previous life. You Basically, you get what you deserve. Buddhism rejected the caste system. It had a slightly different approach. It said, actually, suffering is just an illusion. It's not real. And the way that you realize it's not real is realizing that actually none of what you see around you is real. You just have to detach yourself from this reality. Detach yourself from desiring anything in this reality. Detach yourself from 
desiring ice cream to desiring other people. It doesn't matter. It's all just an illusion. Self-enlightenment comes when we completely detach ourselves from what we think is real, and it's not. Another major belief system, Islam says that there is a God, Allah, and he's controlling everything as it were. He's pulling all the strings like a master puppeteer so that there is really no such uh, thing as free will. And so since everything that happens is God's will and since suffering happens, then suffering is God's direct will in every instance. And ours is not to question it or to, or really, ours, the only thing to do is to submit to it. The eyes of Allah look to and fro across the face of the earth to see who is submitting to his will and who isn't to see who's truly righteous and who isn't so you don't question it you just submit now and then finally if you're an atheist you might regard all these different attempts to understand and make sense of suffering as just a completely misguided superstitious attempt uh, to uh, not face reality what reality well from the perspective of one atheist uh, writer, Richard Dawkins, the reality that there is no supernatural element to life, be it God, karma, or whatever one else one might appeal to in order to make sense of suffering. According to um, Dawkins, uh, suffering's not just or unjust, it's not right or wrong, it's just bad luck. After all, as he says in his book, A River Out of Eden, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are gonna get hurt, other people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it nor any justice. The universe, he says, uh, has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. In other words, lion eats zebra, wolf eats lamb, strong hurts weak, and that's just the way things are. And then a proportion of atheist philosophers, Frederick Nietzsche might be a classic example, would even suggest that not only is that the way things are, that's the way things ought to be, including in human relationships. The strong ought to dominate the weak, and suffering is just nature's way of weeding out the weak. And if, in case you think such crazy ideas only exist in university lecture halls, um, Adolf Hitler was strongly influenced by the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. Just these examples alone make it very clear that when it comes to the question of suffering, which is a question that we all face as human beings, there are some very different explanations on offer and the differences make a difference. In contrast to some of these uh, explanations on offer that I've just mentioned, Christianity doesn't assume that suffering is deserved, so we should do nothing about it. It doesn't say suffering is just an illusion, so we should ignore it. It doesn't say suffering is just God's direct will every time, so we shouldn't question it. It doesn't say that suffering is just natural, so we should accept it. It doesn't deny, nor does it diminish, the reality of evil and suffering in our world. In fact, the reality of evil and suffering is taken very seriously in Christianity, which is why at the center of Christianity you find a cross. In response to a suffering world, Christianity offers a suffering savior, Jesus Christ. I remember um, many years ago when my eldest daughter, Grace, um, who's now 10, was 18 months old, and it was time for her to go to the hospital to get her needles to be, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, indoctrinated? No. <laughs> Inoculated. Yes. Yes. Inoculated, immunized, vaccinated, you know, getting your needles. And, 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 and of course, um, my wife hated the idea of having to be there for that, so she kindly volunteered me for the job. And uh, so as I took my daughter Grace to the hospital to get her needles, uh, I put her on my lap. And I was absolutely uh, petrified because do you know what the nurses do? They, they get you to, to sort of settle them and make them feel completely happy. Like there's nothing wrong in the world and nothing bad is ever going to happen to them. In other words, those nurses make you entirely complicit with the act of violence that's just about to happen. And, and so as I'm sitting there, uh, knowing what's about to happen, I'm looking at Grace's face and I'm afraid. I'm afraid that when she perceives as an 18-month-old child that me, her father, is allowing uh, her to be hurt, that she's going to think I don't love her anymore. 
So as the needle eventually goes into Grace's arm and her face goes instantly red and tears start pouring down her eyes, a uh, face, I'm looking at her eyes. And thankfully, I didn't see an expression, why don't you love me anymore? But what I did see on the expression of her now tear-stained face was the question, why? Why, Daddy? Given that I know that you love me, are you allowing this to happen to me? Now, the reality was that Grace was of such an age that even if I had tried to explain it to her, she wouldn't have understood. But the fact that an 18-month-old didn't have the capacity to understand why any good parent would allow a perfectly unknown stranger to stick a needle into her arm didn't mean that there were no good reasons. I knew that one day she would possess the capacity to understand, but that for now... All she had to go on was her trust in me. But her trust, I realized, was not an unreasonable trust. It was not a blind faith. It was a faith based on the evidence of my love for her from the very first day of her life. Similarly, Christianity holds that we can trust that God has good reasons for, for allowing to happen what happens in this life, even if we ourselves can't understand them, that he is wise and he is good and that one day we will understand, but not today and in all likelihood, not in this lifetime. Now, someone might object and say that is just a blind faith, but according to the Bible, it's not. It's a faith based on the evidence of God's love for us in Jesus Christ the one who suffered on the cross for us. As the the pastor Tim Keller writes, we may not know the exact reason why we suffer in any given instance, but one thing our suffering cannot mean in light of the cross, it cannot mean that God doesn't love us. So having considered four insights from the Word of God, that the Bible affirms our instinct that the way this world is is not the way that it should be, that the Bible explains why suffering does not disprove a loving God, that the Bible reminds us that not all suffering is meaningless, and that the Bible reveals to us that God himself suffers with us, I want to reflect on the fifth and final of our insights from the Bible, which... um, I would say, even in the midst of suffering and pain, offers us hope, which is this. The Bible assures us that one day there shall be no more suffering and death. Just as God's suffering on the cross through Christ reminds us that this world is not the way that it should be, so too his resurrection from the grave assures us that this world will one day be restored to what it should be. Now, it's true that if this life is all there is, then we are without hope in a world full of pain and suffering and death over which we have no ultimate control. But according to the Bible, this life, it's not all there is. There is hope and meaning beyond this world and beyond this life, beyond it, but not separate to it. This life is a chapter in our story, but the final chapter hasn't happened yet. Like Mary in the passage I read at the opening. Weeping at the feet of Jesus in response to Lazarus's death, we are only midway through the story. Mary thought it was the end, but it wasn't. Because in the midst of a grieving community when all hope seems lost, Jesus walks to the opening of the tomb and cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And in the blink of an eye, tears of sadness are transformed into tears of joy. Like Mary and Martha, now we grieve, but only for a little while longer. Because one day, the world will be restored to what it should be. One day, Jesus will wipe away every tear. One day, the sting of suffering will be removed. One day, all that is wrong will be put right One day, in the words of Sam Gamgee from Lord of the Rings, all that is sad in the world will come untrue. 
And in the meantime, Jesus asks us to trust him. Even in the midst of disappointments and pain so terrible, we cannot help but cry out to God in frustration and in tears. But even then, we can trust him, not only because, let's face it, where else have we to go, but also because the one who promises to be with us is worthy of our trust, and he has the scars to prove it. Thank you. So we're going to give Simon a minute to breathe. And um, if, if you'd like to go into that link, uh, if you can, if you're more or less tech savvy, um, go into that link. And there's loads of questions here. You can ask more, but um, we want to sort of answer the questions that most people are interested in. So in, if, you look at, if you go in, look at the questions, you can like them, you can press like, and therefore it goes sort of up on the scale. So the, the questions with most likes are the ones we're going to answer first. Um, so I'll give you one minute to look at it. So maybe instead of answering or asking more, is check what you would like uh, Simon to answer, and then Simon will have a go at it. Um, so I'll give you one minute, and then we'll, we'll start with the top first. So um, we'll start asking these questions, and it's all moving around in my telephone. So it's going to be tricky to realize which one we've asked and which one we haven't. But I'm going to start with the first one. So how do we explain, oh, now it's changed, why God allows suffering to others when they assume that God is actually angry or similar, especially when there's uh, natural disasters and diseases? Okay, great. So a couple of things there. There was something about natural disasters and something about why God would allow people to think it's, because, thank you very much, uh, that, that it's because he's angry with them. Yeah, okay, great. So... Um, let me try to say something about natural disasters. People often ask about natural disasters. Um, they're not, they're not human-caused uh, suffering, so why would God allow natural disasters in particular? Um, theologians have two responses to this. One is uh, that n natural disasters are part of the cosmic implication of our having uh, disconnected ourselves from God and gone our own way, and that as a result, because we are... Um, made in the image of God and we have far more significance than we realize. Our choices and our actions have had cosmic implications that's even affected the natural order so that the world is in some sense uh, not the way it should be, broken and natural disasters are a symptom of that. Other theologians would say actually uh, things like earthquakes and tsunamis and you know what we would say natural disasters, they're just part of the, the way the physical world replenishes itself and brings life and that actually the theory is that prior to becoming disconnected with God, in other words, had we never become disconnected with God, um, we would have maintained what, uh, what the first humans uh, had before they disconnected from God, which is an incredibly deep and interconnected relationship with the natural world. In other words, I don't know if you ever know about um, animals who sometimes seem to know when there's disaster coming and they, they run to higher ground before the tsunami strikes and they, they leave the plane before the earthquake strikes. It's like animals have a connection with the natural world that we don't have. So too the idea is that prior to becoming disconnected with God, our connection with the natural world was so strong that we would have understood the way things operate and, and, and preemptively adapted ourselves to tsunamis, earthquakes, and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then the other question related to um, why God would allow people to... Um, it's often mysterious to me why God allows people to have false views of who he is and what he's like for so long. I can only say that um, I know... Uh, that the Bible teaches that God's wisdom and understanding and knowledge is so much greater than ours and often his timing and the way he works things out um, often run counterintuitive to the way we think that it should happen and often God can um, uh, allow us to have a false understanding of him much longer that would seem necessary from my point of view, but it, it, God is still able to bring about the things that he wants to bring about in people's lives. And, and how he's able to do that and the, the way in which he knows the, 
the, the right timings for this or that, uh, you know, you only get to see it in retrospect. But the, the short answer to that is someone currently having a false view of God does not stop God being able to act in their life, both in the now and in the future. And he will often use, if you're a Christian, you and I as the means to be that um, uh, one who brings the clarity. I'll just finally say, say, that, say this. Um, I've had so many conversations with people who say, I don't like your God. And I say, tell me about the God that you don't like. And when they tell me about the God that they don't like, I often find myself saying, I don't like the God that you're talking about either. But the God that you're talking about is not the God of the Bible please let me share with you what the God of the Bible is really like. So if you're a Christian, part of our task is actually helping people to understand what God is really like. So um, this is quite a, a classic one. Why do young children die from drowning, cancer, killed by others? And it's so hard to understand. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as I said at the start, there are no easy answers to the question of suffering. And the things that you just mentioned are examples of the question that we've been exploring in this talk this evening. Why does God allow those instances of suffering and many more? To try to summarize uh, what I've uh, unpacked over the last 25 minutes, most of the time we can't say in the specific why God allowed that particular, inst that particular tragedy to occur, why God allowed that particular instance of suffering to occur. He doesn't give us that God view of the world. In fact, the Bible warns us against um, saying, I know why God allowed this or that instance of suffering. If it, um, a famous incident in the Bible, the Tower of Siloam, the tower fell, tragically people were killed and, the, and, and people said, Jesus, is that because they were bad people? Did they deserve that? And Jesus is like, no, that's not why that happened. We live in a world where bad things do happen. Don't try to guess what's happened in that specific or that specific circumstance. So we don't, we're not given the knowledge to know why God allowed that one or that instance or that instance. We only have general knowledge that we live in a fallen and broken world where things are not the way that they should be. That in the midst of this broken world where we experience such heartache and tragedy, we can still trust God, even if we don't have all the reasons at our disposal. And that at God's disposal, there is the resource that one day he shall make all that is wrong, he shall put it right. One day all that shall be restored. So Christians don't go around saying, I've got all the answers to the questions of suffering, it's easy. What we can say is, we can trust God in the midst of our suffering. And if you're a Christian, not only can you trust God, God also wants you to be um, uh, an instrument of, of helping others in the midst of their pain and their suffering and helping to alleviate suffering in your neighborhoods as well. God gives us the resources to help others uh, in suffering and pain with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. At the end of the day, one of the most debilitating things about tragedies is that it all just seems meaningless and that if death is the end for all of us, then the whole thing is just absurd and the whole thing is meaningless. Unless at the heart of the universe, there is a God who loves us and has the resources ultimately to, to restore everything that has been broken. Christians choose to put their trust in that God, not only because he is all-knowing and all-powerful, but also because he enters into our suffering. Again, as I said, the cross is God's answer in this life to a hurting world. So here's a, a classic question, very good one. Why are some people's prayers answered and others not? <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, um, prayer is, 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 so, is so mysterious. We do know on the one hand that of course, it would be terrible if God answered everyone's prayers every time the way they asked it. I mean, how many of you 
prayed to marry this certain person or this certain person when you were this age and looking back on it you're like thank you lord that you didn't answer that crazy crazy prayer um and 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 certainly the bible doesn't um uh tell us that prayer is like you know god's like our holy butler and we go to him and we we uh, we tell him what to do by by using the power of prayer and then god has to do everything we say it's far more dynamic it's far more relational The reason that Jesus died on the cross for you and I was to have a relationship. And and talking to God, which we call prayer, is a really important part of that relationship. The most important part is is not what we make God do for us. It's who we become in that relationship. And so learning to trust God, learning to see when he does answer prayer... By the way, we always think answering prayer means giving us what we want. That's not necessarily what the Bible teaches. God can answer prayer with, um, yes, I will give you what you've asked. No, I won't give you what you've asked. Now is not the right time. Wait. Um, And so there's so much more dynamic and and, and relationship to it. All that being said, God loves it when we ask him for things. He loves it when we bring our needs, our requests to him. And over time, he will teach us to trust him even when he doesn't give us everything we want as soon as we want it. I'm a parent, and I know if I gave my children everything they want whenever they want it, I'd be a terrible parent. (laughs) Brilliant. Um, So what should we tell those who appear to suffer a huge amount, much more than us, when we're talking about suffering and we are in quite a comfortable place and someone's really suffering, how, how can we share uh, everything you're sharing with someone who's actually going through a very hard time? Yeah, I think I might have mentioned this, but if someone is in the midst of grief and suffering, um, the, the, the best thing you, that you could do is just come alongside them and demonstrate by your love and your care and your presence that you're there for them. And if you're a Christian you're helping them to see something of the heartbeat of God for them in the midst of suffering. That's not the time to try to answer all the questions. Even when someone's saying, why Why would God do this? Why? You know, it's rarely ever the time to start answering. Just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm with you. I'm praying. I'm with you. There will come a time, but not then. Um, Yep, and also very difficult to um, talk about the question of suffering if everything seems to be going smoothly in your own personal life and uh, and and not in the life of the person that you're talking to, um, and then that just requires sensitivity as well. Um, one thing that you can do, obviously, is not <clears throat> point so much to your life, but help the person that you're talking to. Um, at the appropriate time that you can have those conversations to see what Jesus is like, to see that that person who feels like you can't understand what they're going through, no one in the world understands the depth of the pain and the loneliness and the grief that they're going through, Um, that you can point them to the one, the only one who truly can understand the depth of the grief and the pain and the loss that they're going through, the one who made them, who loves them, and the one who wants to come alongside and fill them with his presence through his Holy Spirit. This is the hope that any of us can offer because we're not pointing to ourselves, we're pointing to him. Brilliant. Um, So, a theoretical question. (laughs) Did God create sin suffering? If yes... How can he be all loving? If no, does that mean not everything was created by God? Yeah, very good. Uh, um, so uh, the, the question, uh, how did uh, evil come into the world if God is good, is a, a profound philosophical and theological question which many have wrestled with. Um, the the response to that that I find most compelling um, aligns with what a number of um, church theologians throughout the centuries have, 
uh, a line that they've taken uh, most uh, famously would be St. Augustine. A and it, it actually goes something like this, and it, it is difficult to wrap our heads around, but that God did not create evil, but God did create creatures with moral freedom who could choose good or in their choice of not to follow God and the good that would result in evil. Um, and the Bible talks about that that's happened at the level of human beings and mysteriously at a cosmic level with angels and angelic beings as well and that the origin of the devil, Satan, has something to do with that fallenness of the angelic host or at least a good part of them um, of which the Bible doesn't give us much information. In other words, God in his power didn't create evil but was able to create beings who had the choice to follow him and in the absence of making that choice or, or in the negation of that choice, that is where evil, evil comes from. And then where theologians and philosophers wrestle, is they're like, well, did God really create it then because he created the people who had the ability to make that choice? And they're like, no, well, actually, no, they genuinely had the freedom. Um, and so it's, it's, not, it's not on God. I'll leave you to wrestle uh, with the implications uh, of that answer uh, in your own time. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, this is quite relevant to our reality today. So where's God in the middle of mental health suffering when it seems impossible to believe in the truth of him and the Bible? Yes. Um, where is God? As uh, the Apostle Paul uh, says in Acts chapter 17 when he's speaking to um, a lot of the philosophers, uh, the Greeks in the Areopagus, um, quoting their own poets. Um, God, is, God is not far from any one of us. Uh, and when someone is in the midst of grief, uh, including mental grief, um, God is right there waiting uh, for us to reach out and not rely on our own uh, uh, resources, but see that there is hope in him. God is right there. Though he might feel distant, uncaring, looking on, oblivious to the petty sufferings of these little human beings who matter nothing. No, you are the apple of God's eye and his face has been upon you from the very first day of your life. He is right there. Call out to Jesus and he is right there. That's the hope um, that we have. And I would just add that um, to me, it seems really rather apparent that as a culture, the further we have divorced ourselves from the idea that there is a God who made us and who loves us and that we're not here by accident, we're here on purpose because this God wanted us to be here and he has a destiny for us to live into and plans and purposes for us and that our lives therefore have meaning. And, and, and huge significance. The further we have moved away from that, that the idea that there is no God and that we're just here through a random combination of time plus matter plus chance and that there is no ultimate purpose to anything and therefore the only way that I can find any sense of significance or identity is to try to create it for myself. But the only way I can have any sort of identity of significance in this, the noise that is all the TikTok and YouTube videos that are all the people trying to also create identity and significance for themselves. It is, I have to work double time to stand out from the crowd. And, and what many psychiatrists and psychologists are saying is that the reason so many are drowning in mental anguish is that we're trying so hard to create an identity for ourselves that makes us feel like we matter, that our life has significance, that what we do in this world makes a difference. And yet, Everything we're being told tells us that ultimately all I am as a human being boils down to um, the inexorable laws of physics and chemistry operating on molecules and atoms, and that's all that a, a human being is. So it really matters what we believe. And to see people discover who they really are in Jesus Christ can make such a huge difference. All of that is not to say that as Christians we don't suffer um, from mental health um, issues as well. 
we do have a couple of advantages, one of which is to know that no matter how hard life is, it's not meaningless and God is with you. And secondly, there is the incredible uh, healing factor of being known and knowing others in community. And we're living in a society today in which many people have no community at all. So that if the sort of community you get to experience uh, in a church like this can make a huge difference to the epidemic today that is the mental health. Brilliant. So I'm going to ask the, the last one. There's still more, but um, we're running out of time. So this last one says, is it not a bit dark that God knew we were going to sin and bring about destruction on ourselves only for us to then only be saved by repenting and believing? Can you repeat the first? Uh, is it not a bit dark that dark. God knew we were going to get things wrong, basically destroy and only... That, and the only way out is by repenting and believing. Is... Mm. Yeah, I think I know where the, the, the question's coming from. Uh, it, it sort of seems like um, God created a, a, a cruel game, as it were, where he can see it and this has to happen, and then God gets to come in and be the rescuer. And um, yeah, I think, I think, it gets confusing when, you, when you're trying to understand something that's very difficult for a human being to enter into and to understand, which is, which is God's uh, foreknowledge. And I think one of the things that we often do is confuse God's foreknowledge of events with um, us not, not having genuine freedom in the moment. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, um, dog tamers know that uh, if you um, put uh, dog food into a room with hungry dogs, um, they know what's going to happen to that food very quickly. The dogs are going to eat that food. You, you could, that's almost like having foreknowledge. Uh, you know what's going to happen. That doesn't mean that the dogs didn't have genuine freedom to go and eat the food. Um, foreknowledge is very tricky but if you can another uh, thought experiment um, is uh, now I think I'll leave it at that for, for time but but the important thing is the Bible tells us that what happens in this life it's it's not a cruel game um, God isn't playing around with us like puppets for his amusement we see that most clearly in Jesus Christ, that Jesus himself, um, on the, the night uh, that he was arrested, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knew uh, the trial that awaited him, which was to um, be crucified on the cross on our behalf and to bear the weight um, of our sin and um, all that evil um, throughout human history in his own body and to experience the separation of God resulting from that. And the Bible says that he um, sweated drops of blood uh, as he prayed. And that's real. It's not a story. Um, it's not a myth. That really happened in human history. This is the incredible, this is what, this is, this is the earth shattering belief that we have as Christians that God um, really came into human history, really experienced what it is to walk uh, and live and breathe as a human being, and really experienced the excruciating pain and torture and mental anguish not only the physical aspects of the crucifixion, but to take the sin of the world on his shoulders, yours and mine and the sin of every person who's ever lived. It's not a game. It's real. Uh, and he did it because he loved us. And I guess I would just love to finish by saying, if you have not yet yourself connected with God, but you're here 
and your thinking and your searching, can I encourage you from my, from my heart to really investigate and think deeply about this? Because if Jesus Christ truly uh, lived and died and rose again for us, then it's a game changer. It, it means that death does not have the final say over your life or mine. It means that the, the various ways in which we might have um, shipwrecked or minorly shipwrecked our lives at various times does not have to have the final say over who we are. That, that Jesus can, can redeem us and transform us and heal us and restore us from the inside out. If you haven't yet experienced that, can I invite you to do that? I know that the guys here are going to be running uh, a course where you can investigate that for yourself called the Alpha Course. And that is a course well worth um, giving a go. Because like I said, if true, death doesn't have the final say over your life. I just want to finish by saying to everyone, thank you so much for your questions. They've been heartfelt. They've been deep. They've been really important. And I really appreciate the opportunity to have engaged with your questions this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.